Good morning again, LifePoint Crossing. Still so, oh, I knew there was good energy in here today. Not even kidding. So glad you're here. Listen, I don't like getting in the habit of talking before I talk, but sometimes it's just appropriate. So uh, this, of course, again, is going to be in the announcements, but let me just put a little extra emphasis behind it. On Saturday the 18th, we are having a volunteer appreciation dinner. You guys, you have to have some idea of how much I and we appreciate you guys who are the backbone and the tibia and the humerus and the eyes and ears and toes and whatever of this body that is the church. So if you serve over the last year in any way, some of those are obvious if you're in the kids ministry or the band or whatever, if you help it treat the street, if you're on the prayer team, if you're wondering, wait, well, does it count that I, yes, it counts. We want, really, really, we just want to honor you and celebrate you, but we need to know that you're coming. So the next steps launcher, little green button in the bottom right-hand corner on lifepointcrossing.com, there's a place there to RSVP and your whole family's invited because we want to make it possible for you to come and we just need to know that you're going to come. So if you do that during the message here, I'm not even mad at you. That's like, I think that's wonderful. But please do that so that we can be appropriately prepared and have a great time for you guys. And we want you to come. Please do be a part. Welcome to, hey, we're through the series on money. I know everybody's very excited about that. And welcome to Relationship. This will generally, I think, be much less sort of confrontational to our hearts. So hopefully this, this will go well. But listen, is there anything more important in life than finding the one? There isn't, is there? That really is the most important thing in life. This represents an entire genre of movies and books and TV shows. And even if it isn't the, the main focus then it's always the secondary plot, isn't it, in every movie ever made, except for Aliens, which my roommate Craig and I would watch on Valentine's Day when we were single and angry in college. It was great, no love story whatsoever, and so that really worked out well for us. But there's, there's nothing that takes up, especially if you, if you haven't found the one or if you just remember what it was like, is there anything that takes up more of your headspace? and more of your time and your energy and maybe your prayer time and messes with your life and your emotions more than finding the one. And listen, speaking of my roommate Craig and I, I feel like nowhere is this more clearly exemplified than at a Christian college. How many here, I know there's at least a couple, you've been to a Christian college that anybody, yet yeah, Ryan back there, you and Haley actually met at Christian college, didn't you? I think, is that accurate? Are we the only ones? I know Laura and I did, but we, although it was different ones. But you, you guys, you have to know, that's the reason Christian colleges exist. I mean, really, people end up at a Christian college for one of two reasons. Number one is their parents are worried about them, and so that's the only place they'll pay for them to go. Or if you go voluntarily, it's because you're looking for the one. I have my own experience with that. I started out at a state school in Minnesota, and after about a year there, I was like, you know, I, I, I could get a degree anywhere, but my chances here of finding a cool girl who loves Jesus are staggeringly slim. It became very apparent to me, and I started to think about it. I was like, you know, uh, in high school, there weren't a lot of girls who loved Jesus, but there were some. I mean, there was, there was a lot more, at least percentage-wise, than there is here. And this college is a lot bigger than my high school. Like, where are they? And of course, always asking better questions leads to better answers. And so as soon as I asked the question, where are they? I was like, oh, that's the answer. They're all concentrated at Christian college. And so there were a lot of reasons I transferred, but about 80% was because I was looking for the one. And I wasn't the only one, you guys. If you've, maybe there's only a couple of us, but what's the joke at every Christian college that's ever existed? It's all the, the same joke. Girls specifically go there to get their what degree? The, yes, the MRS. That's exactly right. It's just the, the letters before their name instead of the letters after their name. And so this is why Christian colleges exist. Anyway, uh, however it happens, for not everybody, but for a lot of us, one way or another, we end up, we, we, we find the one, and it's so romantic, and it's so exciting, and we go and we make that commitment, we get married, and, and congratulations are offered and received, and it's so wonderful, but then at some point, it becomes evident that you know, finding the one and living with the one, 
those are not exactly the same thing. And sometimes you even start to wonder, like, maybe this wasn't actually the one in the first place. I mean, if this was the one, they wouldn't be doing these things. They wouldn't be saying these things. We wouldn't be having these issues. Shouldn't it be a whole lot easier? Isn't that the entire idea of the the, the fact that that there's the one? Isn't isn't it? And so the good news is I'm told and I read that the divorce rate in our society has fallen to about 40%. But of course, the bad news is that one of the big reasons for that is that there's a whole group of people who have just completely given up on the idea of marriage in the first place. And of course, cohabitation rates are way up. And we all know that those relationships end at a much higher rate than marriages. And so here we are where in our society, there's just a overwhelming percentage of our committed relationships that end badly. So just for the sake of being conservative, let's take that 40% number and think about how this really interacts with us and what this really would be like. Because if you knew there was a 40% chance that you would get in a car accident on the way home from church today, would that affect the way that you drove? You would have two hands on the wheel at all times. The radio's off. You're not looking at your phone, much less trying to shoot off a text to your bestie at the stoplight. You're the most conscientious driver the world has ever seen. What if there was a 40% chance that your house, your, your kitchen was going to catch fire when you're cooking dinner tonight? They say the watch pot never boils. You're going to take the chance that the pot doesn't boil, but you are not going to take your attention away from that stove. In fact, some of you might even say, we, we're just not even going to, we can't take that chance. We're going to order Chinese. Kids, what do you want? Some others of you, you still can't take that chance, but you don't have the money to have someone else cook your food for you, so you're just going to go hungry, and we'll just see you in the morning, because 40% is way too high of a chance for disaster. But then with our marriages and our relationships, we enter into them, knowing that there's this staggeringly monstrous chance statistically that it's going to end in disaster but what do we do instead of taking special precautions and and being extra careful we just kind of take our cues from like everybody else right just the people around us right exactly the people who make up the 40%. It's just whatever our parents did or our friends or whatever it is that we see on on TV or in the movies. We just kind of do what's normal, I guess, right? But, But it's doing what's normal that leads to this staggeringly huge rate of ending in disaster. And so wouldn't you say that it's time for a relationship? And I'm so glad you're here. And, and so for the next, I think, five weeks, we'll be going through this. And listen, this is obviously going to apply to you if you're married. It will equally obviously apply to you if you're at some point going to be or likely to be married. And listen, if you are not and maybe never will be, you're not forgotten here. A lot more of this is going to be more applicable to you than you might think or be afraid of. So I hope you guys will be in for this and see some of the incredibly helpful and profound wisdom and keys that the scriptures have for us in how to deal with our relationships. And so we're starting today with this idea of finding the one. And it really is the most important thing. And you absolutely have to get this right. But here's our starting point. Is the one is not, cannot be another human being which I know is one of the least romantic things I could possibly say in the month of February and at the start of a relationship series. But it also might be one of the most helpful and most important because it's really pretty clear. The very first of the Ten Commandments from the Old Testament can be pretty well summed up as put God first, right? Who's the one? It's God. It has to be God. When Jesus is asked, what's the most important commandment? What does he say? It's basically, he says, to love God. Who's the one? God is the one. God has to be the one. And it's so clear. And we're going to actually look a little bit in depth here at some verses from a a very longer and kind of confusing portion of Scripture, but we're going to zero in on some of the more simple and more clear. But this is going to be from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, starting at verse 32 for today. I mean, verses that I don't think I've ever, I don't think I've ever heard preached on for just for what it's worth. So these might be new for a lot of us. But here's what it says. It says, I want you to be free from concerns of this life. 
And this doesn't sound very relationship here, actually, but he says an unmarried man, well, he can spend his time doing the Lord's work. Right? Thinking how to please him, which is obviously the most important. This is, this is one, right? And he says, but a married man, well, he has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. Yeah, he, he really should. That's a good thing to do. But what that means is that his interests now, they're divided. Okay? Well, in the same way, of course, a woman who's no longer married or has never been married it can be devoted to the Lord, holy in body and in spirit, but of course, the exact same dynamic, a married woman now also has to think about her earthly responsibilities and how to please her husband. And he says, listen, I'm not saying this, or I'm saying this for your benefit. I'm constantly amazed at how some of even the most difficult teachings that come from Scripture are so consistently, explicitly put in the framework of how this is, re- this is for your best interest. This really, this is for your good. And this is the same. It says, I, I'm saying this for your benefit, I, not, not to place restrictions on you, but what I want is I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord the best, right? Obviously, the most important, the number one, with as few distractions as is possible. And there are a couple of very clear things from these verses here, but the most obvious, perhaps, is that it's built on the assumption that what's the one? God is the one. God is the most important thing. Listen, if you've come here today, if you came to church because you thought it might be a really good place to meet a nice boy or girl to, to get to know and if things work out, maybe even settle down with, you know what? You're right. It's way better than Tinder or a bar. And we have some great people. Truly, like, I hope if, if that's you, I hope it goes well for you. But I'll say this. Guess who for sure you can meet every week at church? Is your, the one. Every week we're trying and working to help introduce you to the one. Isn't that good news? So, and one of, the, of course, the other clear implications that this teases out, and, and it's as clear as can be, but for whatever reason, I, I don't think we've ever heard this preached on, and we never talk about this in the church, is that, you know what, after you've found the one, okay, which is God, then if you have a spouse, then clearly that's going to be the two, right? And so what he says very clearly is, you know what, once you've found the one, you, I don't know, you might not even really need the two, and as clear as can be, it's not going to be anti-marriage. That'll be, if, if it looks like even it could be here, it'll be explicit in just a couple verses later, in, in just a moment. But you know the Bible's not anti-marriage. It's not anti-marriage. But it does indicate pretty clearly that, ah, you know what, it is, it is certainly possible that, you know, once you have the one, the, the two could even, on certain levels, make that kind of more complicated and, and even get in the way. I, I don't know why this is, but I think this needs to change where we seem to have this idea or this assumption so often that if there's somebody who's single, that what that means is that they've been searching for the one. And for whatever reason, it just hasn't, hasn't happened for them yet. And, and that has to be a matter of just great anguish and loneliness and unfulfillment. And so we'll pray for them. We, we may even try and introduce our friends to them. And listen, none of this is necessarily wrong or bad. There are uh, certainly a lot of people who do wish to be married and for whatever reason it hasn't worked out for them. And, and obviously from what I just told you, there's a time where that was me and I completely would have accepted your prayers and I would have loved to have met your friends. But let's not get this idea that somehow singleness is God's second best for people. That that's, you know, you lost the showcase showdown, so, you know, here's your consolation prize, and, and you can go home now. It's, it's very, as clear as can be that this really, if you're up for it, this really might be your best option. And again, he specifically, explicitly says, you know, this isn't for your detriment, this is, this is for your benefit. And as clearly as can be, it's not anti-marriage. Again, this is, comes down just a couple of verses later, but he says this. He says, so the person who marries his fiancée does well. And the part of you, if you read the, the verse, it, you almost feel like you want to put a but where there is an and, but he doesn't even necessarily offset that and say, but the person who doesn't marry does even better. Right? It's really, these are both very good. Right? The person who marries his fiancée does well and the person who doesn't marry well, does even better. 
When Laura and I woke up on August 18th, 2021, okay, so about a year and a half ago, not that long, both of us were about 98% sure that in a very short time, I was going to be called and asked to come lead a church in a town called Plattsburgh, New York. Now, I had been out of ministry for a couple of years, and I wanted nothing more than to be back in ministry. I felt like I needed to be. I just really felt like I needed to be. And listen, I could love God and serve people anywhere. That's fine. But when I learned about Plattsburgh, New York, which you may not have heard of, I hadn't either until I learned about the position, this was just about the most perfect location that I ever could have imagined. I mean, it was just enough of a town to be a town. It was like 30,000 people or something. There was a, a State University of New York campus there, and I don't know how well that shows up, but it was on the, immediately directly on the west shore of amazing Lake Champlain and the Vermont border, and then, really much more important to me, one hour away from Lake Placid. You may know that as the place where they held the Winter Olympics back in 80 or whenever that was. Here's what I knew it as, was the heart of the trails and trailheads for the Adirondack Mountains. And listen, if you know, for about 10 years, I had been somewhere between an avid and obsessed New Hampshire hiker. But of course, part of what that meant is that basically anywhere there was to go, anything there was to see, I had been and had seen at least a couple of times, maybe a few times. And so this, to me, represented a whole new world of adventure along with ministry opportunity. This was amazing. And so when, after I submitted my application, I, you know, things happen and they called my references. I had one of them who called me afterwards and said, Ross, they told me that you're their number one candidate. And then we, and, you know, we were living in New Hampshire. This was about four hours away. So we were able, both Laura and I, to go up and, and we went up and drove up for a visit and I did an interview and it was the best interview I have ever done. It was the best version of me that the world has ever seen. And when Laura and I had breakfast with the interim pastor the next morning, who was guiding the church through the process, he looked at us and he said, Ross, they really like you. And he started encouraging us to take the next steps toward wherever that would go. And so, of course, I'd been sending out resumes, so we'd sort of been getting the house ready to sell and whatever that would mean. We went home and we started really getting the house ready to sell. And I couldn't have been more enthusiastic. This was just about the... I wouldn't have been able to even draw up something as perfect and as inspiring as this was. Here's what I did not know is that when we visited and what I saw was ministry opportunity and the best days off that I could imagine, Laura felt isolation and maybe depression. And so she was tremendously conflicted about this because of course she didn't want to be the, the wife that would be in, in the, the way of what, something that could be a, a great opportunity for her husband. But she didn't want to go. And so later that day, on August 18th, when I got a message saying that, in fact, this was not going to happen, we were equally shocked. But where I was sorely disappointed, she was really relieved. And I didn't even know to be relieved because how close was I to being torn between following something that would seem to me to be a, a wonderful way to serve God and people and, and also in an incredible environment, but something where my wife really wasn't on board. And so somehow, miraculously, three weeks later, I answered an ad from a church in Blue Springs, Missouri, and, and I knew that she would be thrilled to go back to the Midwest, Kansas City area. I didn't even have to ask her. I knew that was an easy win for her, and somehow, miraculously, that worked out. That's still absolutely mind-blowing for me. But, so I didn't have to make a terrible decision, but how terrible of a decision would that have been Listen, if you know me and or Laura, I hope it's obvious, it should be obvious that I am as delighted as I could possibly be to be married to her. She's been an incredible partner in life and ministry in a thousand different ways. When I married my fiance, I did well. Amen. But life really is just simpler if it's just you, right? And not even just like for pastors or people who are like in vocational ministry, 
it, you're just more free to serve God solely and, and single-heartedly. And listen, it, it's not wrong to desire marriage. It's not wrong to be married. This is as clear as it can be, but singleness is not second best. Let's, let's stop acting like the goal of life and following Jesus is to be married because God's the one, okay? And your spouse, if you have one, that's the two. So about that. Because I think this is as, as clear as can be, but people seem to not like it. And I think I understand. It was before I transferred to college in, in California, and I was in Minnesota, as, this comes up more than it seems like it should lately, but I worked for a couple years there at the Happy Chef family restaurant. And it's always funny just because it's called the Happy Chef. I don't know. I wish it wasn't the, but it's funnier if you call it the happy chef. So I was there for about two years. Everybody there, that's a long time in a restaurant, right? And it was a smaller restaurant. It wasn't a super big place. And so everybody who was there, they knew me. They knew what I was about. They knew I was following Jesus and was at that time even already starting to take steps toward a life of ministry. And this is just common knowledge. Everybody knew. And so one day, there was a waitress named Kim who struck up a conversation. She was, I don't know how old she was, but she was a little older. I don't know if she was mid-20s or 30 or somewhere in there. But she, she wanted to talk to me about, she had a couple friends who, I guess they must have been pretty serious Christ followers by this conversation, but she was really bothered by this because she said that they had, they had told each other that they were never going to be the most important thing in the other's life, that God was always going to be first and then each other were always going to be second. And she, she explained to me how she didn't feel like she could really ever be satisfied or fulfilled in a relationship like that, knowing that she would never be the top priority in the life of the other person. And I feel like Happy Chef Kim really probably speaks for the majority of our society. I think that's probably a very, very common feeling if you hear or, or you know, think about a situation like that. But here's part of why, you guys. Let's think this through. It is so terrible to have another human being be the one in your life or for you to be the number one in somebody else's life is because we are specifically designed by God to have him be the one. That means that if a human being is the one, we are expecting them to take the place of God in our life that he has created for himself. And they are expecting you to be and to, to give to them what only God is really able or designed to provide. If you're married, for sure your spouse is your primary human relationship. But no way should that mean that a person is supposed to take the literal place of God in your life. Listen, I know the idea of the one is so romantic, it makes for great movies. So did Chris Farley selling brake pads. It's not that fun in real life. Listen. Yeah, I know, it's like a serious thing. Like, can I laugh at that? Is your, I don't know, you're supposed to laugh at it. I'll just keep talking. Listen. This could, could this be a huge reason why so many of our relationships end with frustration and disappointment? Is because the expectation that we have for somebody in our life or that they might have on us is literally to provide for them or to provide for us what only God really has designed for himself to do. Maybe that's why we end with disappointment and unmet expectations is because we never really thought about it like that or maybe you never really thought about it at all, but you're asking a human being to do for you what only God can. Uh, maybe that's not romantic sounding, like I don't know, but I don't think a 40% divorce rate in a society that's more and more just giving up on the idea of marriage in the first place is really that romantic either. If you think back to relationships that haven't worked out, have you ever felt like no matter who you were, no matter what you did, you could just never be enough or live up to somebody else's expectations for you? Do you think that, listen, and, and maybe you had some growing to do. Probably you did. Probably that's all of us always. But that's all of us always. Could it be that a part of that 
is that somebody was expecting you to be what only God could be for them. Or in your own situation, has there been a, a time where you thought, oh, you know what, I think this could be the one. Could this be the one? What? Good. I, think, I think this is the one. Right? But then when instead of fulfillment, you end up with disappointment, like, what do we typically do? Well, we, ah, it's not the one, I guess. You break it off. It must have been something wrong with them. And so you just go and try and, and find the one somewhere else. Well, of course they weren't the one. They never could have been the one. They should never have been expected to be. God is the one. Your spouse, if you have one, is the two. And listen, this is still a little bit spiritual, but also intensely practical. Let me show you how good this is. Because this is so, so good. It really is, you guys. Happy Chef Kim felt like she could never be fulfilled or satisfied in a relationship where she wasn't the one. She didn't want that. Oh, she was so, so, so sadly and sorely mistaken. If you've been here, let's just tease this out a little bit. What happens when we both make God our one and pursue God first and foremost in our life? Here's what happens. A lot of you were here for a, a big part, the longest message series that we had in 2022 at LifePoint Crossing was the person I want to be. A lot of us remember that, or at least parts of that. The basic premise was we went from the fruit of the Spirit passage in Galatians 5, right, that describes the things that God makes you more of, the things that God produces in your life the further we go with him and the closer we walk with him. And of course, I, I preached all that as, listen, this is good news. The person who God wants to make you into is also the person who you want to be. But let's flip the script on that for just a second. Think about this through the eyes now of the person who you want to be married to. Are these things that you would want the person that you're married to to describe? Here's, if you need the refresher on the list, here's what it is. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Do you want your spouse to be loving and growing in love? Do you want them to be joyful, peaceful, patient? Oh my goodness, of course you do. Listen, I know every time somebody asks, well, you know, what is it that you're looking for in a spouse or a partner? The first answer is always supposed to be, what, sense of humor. I can tell you that when Laura and I were dating, I made her laugh all the time. After 23 years of marriage, it's about twice a year. <laughs> and I hold on to those moments. But I promise you, she wants me to be growing in these. And so, as much as the two of you are following Jesus and are focused on that, and that's the one, right? And, and you're committed to God first and to one another second. You're going to be moving in exactly the same direction in turn, by just by virtue of being being devoted, first of all, to God. That doesn't mean you're both going to think Plattsburgh, New York is the ideal place to serve God and to live. It's still more complicated together than it is separate. But if you ever wonder or worry about you know, growing apart over years or even decades, by virtue of both of you working, traveling together toward Jesus, right, that is ab it's just taken care of on a very, very fundamental level. Isn't this so good? So, Finding your one, it really is the most important thing in life. It really is. You can't get it wrong. But it can't be a person. It's got to be God. And so, all of us here today, single or dating or engaged or married or divorced or any sort of bizarre overlap or two or three or wherever you may be, listen, here's what we all have in common is we should all have the same one and is not a person. Okay. From there, listen, here's more good news. You can kind of follow whatever path you'd like. You can pursue marriage. That's okay. That's good. You can not. I don't know if you can really pursue singleness, but you can just pursue God and you know, see wherever that goes. And in some ways, you're really in actually a better position at that point to pursue God. And whichever you do, like whichever path you take, the idea of making God the one. Listen, people like Happy Chef Kim it's not going to make sense to them. They're going to think it's strange. They're going to think it doesn't make sense. They're going to see how there's no possible way it could work. But for decades now, the data has been in on what happens when we make another human being our one. And the reality is, it just hasn't worked. So congratulations. If you're here, whether or not you've actually committed, we all know who our one should be. And listen, if you're here and you're married, 
Here's some more good news. Your spouse, they just became far, far more adequate as a two than they ever could have been as a one. And your expectations for them just became far, far more reasonable as a two than they ever should have been as a one. Okay, you got to find the one. But it's not a human being. God's the one. Now let's pray. Father, thank you so much. This is so much simpler than the movies and books and TV shows would have made it look like. Thank you that you are not only the one who created us, but you are the one who created us for yourself and clearly and, and desperately sought after us that we would come to you and find our own selves in making you our one. Listen, still praying, if you're here today and you've, you've never taken that step to connect with God, listen, this is literally what you're created for. This is who you are created for. That's not overstated a bit. If anything, that is understated. And listen, this can be your moment. You, you can find your one right here, right now, today at LifePoint Crossing Church, or if you're watching online, wherever you are. Every one of us, it's a simple situation. We're all sinners. There have been things that were wrong. We knew they were wrong. We did them anyway. That sin and God as a just judge can't just forget about that, pretend it didn't exist. That would be an unjust judge. But that's why Jesus came and lived a perfect life in perfect righteousness and then took that penalty, absorbed justice on our behalf for our sin by dying in our place so that he would take our sinfulness and we would take his righteousness and be adopted as children in his family forever. Listen, if that's you, just right where you sit, either here or online, you can pray. Say to God, even in your heart, and he'll hear you. Say, God, I believe that Jesus Christ came and died and was resurrected so that I could be forgiven and adopted as a child in your family for you to be my one. Please come into my life. Begin to make me into the person you created me to be. And give me the life that you have for me. And if that's you and you've just prayed a prayer like that, it's not the words or the prayer that saves you, it's that you put your faith in Jesus, God's grace comes to you through that. You are forgiven and adopted as his child forever. Listen, the best thing you can do is to not try and do this alone. If you're online, send us a message or an email. If you're here in person, go find the person at the point. That's just the corner in the lobby when we're done. Let them know the decision that you made. We'll be able to follow up and help you walking down some healthy steps toward the new life that you have in, in Jesus Christ. And we're so excited about what God is doing in the lives of all of us here at LifePoint Crossing. Hey, for the rest of us, I know this message and these messages kind of hit us all in, in different places and we're in a lot of different situations here today. But here's the one that's the same for all of us. is God's got to be the one. And it's for our benefit. It's literally who we are created to be and what we are created for. Will you commit just right now between yourself and the Spirit of God that whatever else there is in life, whatever else could be in the way, whatever other legitimate and good responsibilities that we have, if that's to, to live with and be godly spouses or you know, children, parents, uncles, aunts, whatever it is, that the number one, the number one is to be who God created us to be and that we will find ourselves when he is our one. Father, we're so grateful that you make this clear and that you give us these opportunities to step into who you created us to be and the way in which you've created us to live. We ask for your spirit to give each one here or watching online the, the strength, the courage, and the follow-through to make these